title of this lesson is The Bible, this is God's Word, The Bible Provides Moral Guidance. Our golden text is, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. We are going to Genesis, and we'll skip on over to the book of Matthew. We will end up in the book of Colossians. There are four chapters in the book of Colossians. It's quite a small little book, very powerful. Paul did not start the church there. That's interesting, and we'll get into that a little bit later on. Uh, <clears throat> Our introduction today is uh, the word moral, M-O-R-A-L, and Webster's Dictionary has some good definitions for that word. It relates to, or it's capable of, making the distinction between right and wrong. It is also uh, implying a morally excellent character involving justice, integrity, and often specifically chastity. We have three points in today's lesson. The first one is the basis of biblical morality and that uh, takes us to the first chapter of the book of Genesis. It also goes to the 22nd chapter of the book, first book of the New Testament, Matthew. Our second point is the scope. The first one was the basis. This one is the scope of biblical morality. We go to the third chapter of Colossians, and then the third point is the goal of biblical morality. Now, by walking in obedience to God's word and living to his moral code of ethics, we will be as lights that are shining in a dark world. Not everybody is, is living a good moral life, but every Christian should be living a good moral life. We have a right relationship with God and we portray the Word of God in our Christian walk and life. Let's go to point one, which is the basis of biblical morality. And under that is A, which is made in the image of God, Book of Genesis, chapter 1. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. On, <clears throat> in the book of Genesis, we discover how God created everything. He started on the first day and created whatever was in his category, and then we move on to the sixth day. On the sixth day of creation, of course on the seventh he rested, but on the sixth day he created man. That's very interesting that he waited till the last day of creation to form man. He had already created all of the animals, all of the growth that comes from the earth. But the last thing that he created was man. Uh, 
One could say maybe that he put it off till the very last because if he had created man first, well, then man could say, well, I just helped in the creation. I was there. I was part of it. Wasn't all God's doings. Humankind had an influence on what was being created. But since he waited for the sixth day, um, we know that everything else was already made and then God created man. Man's body was flesh. Just like all the other animals, man's body was flesh. But God gave him a soul, and the soul distinguishes the human being from the cow and the pig and the dog and the cat and all, all of the animals that God had created. Man was made in the likeness and in the image of God. He is created capable of recognizing what is right and what is wrong. Um, he may do right, and then again, he may do wrong. God commissioned the first couple to populate the earth, and they did that. They did so. He honored humanity by giving them dominion over every other living thing. Man is totally different from the animal world, and yet there are parts like his flesh is uh, similar to the animal world, but the spiritual part of man that God gave him in his soul, no animal, no other animal has that capability. Uh, and so God told them to have control over everything that was in the earth, over every little living thing that moved on the earth. And then we go to the back book of Matthew where he gives the greatest commandment to mankind who has been living on the earth for about 4,000 years now. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment, in, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Remember the law that was given to Moses when the children of Israel were camped at Mount Sinai and God called Moses up to the top of the mountain where he gave him the law. That's where the Ten Commandments come from. Now we're in the book of the New Testament. This is, um, this is a fulfillment of everything that was given to Moses in the Old Testament. And there are two laws, N not all of the law and the prophets that were given to Moses, but there are two main laws in the New Testament. And the greatest of the commandments was love. He gave mankind the ability to love. And he said, you'll put all of that ability into your love for your creator. The love of God comes first. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Then he gave the second great commandment when he said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, all of the Old Testament law and the prophets hang. Number one, the greatest commandment is love. Love. Everybody knows what love is. We hear it all the time in different places, in the news and in stories. But this love 
is to be focused on God. The greatest love is to be focused on God, our, our Father. And the second is to be focused on our neighbor. Now, the lawyers that asked him this question, what's the greatest commandment? They, they were like the scribes. They were very gifted in knowing all the details of the law. They were uh, able to teach the law. So this one lawyer comes to Jesus. And those people were always trying to trip up Jesus and ask him questions that they thought were so very deep and that he would have no answer because they didn't think he was that smart. They never, ever recognized him as the Son of God. So this, when this lawyer asked um, what was the greatest commandment? Then Jesus gave him the answer. We are to love God with our heart, our soul, our mind, our will, our affections, and with our understanding. That means God takes first place in our lives. Matthew Henry says, we must love ourselves. He said we have to have a due regard for ourselves, not to the point of thinking you're better than anybody else, but just having dignity of your own nature and your own body. And then that second commandment that Jesus gave said, we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Uh, sometimes that's a bit difficult to do. How can you love somebody who is unlovable? But God will give us the ability to do so. We honor and esteem all men, and we must wrong and injure not one of them. We are to love. The first, the uh, first Corinthians chapter thirteen is called the love chapter. There was a man by the name of Eugene Peterson who paraphrased that chapter, and this is how he told us. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. To describe a little bit of love like we understand it, uh, we have mothers in this room, at least two or three, and uh, because they are mothers, they have given birth to children. When they carried that child in the womb for nine months and then actually uh, proceed in the birthing process and look at that child for the first time, there is a love unlike anything that you will ever experience in your life. When the mother holds that baby for the very first time, she will go to death's door to bring that child into the world. And she will do without herself to make sure that that child has every kind of opportunity that is presented that they might be able to obtain. A mother's love, it gives us a little bit of an idea of what love really is of what it contains, of how it acts. But our first love is to be to God, 
who gave us life and who gave his son that we might not have to go to the awful place called hell. So we love our neighbor as ourselves. So just who is our neighbor? Our neighbor might be defined as anyone that comes in contact with us. We, uh, we are to love that person to the point that we, we don't talk about them, we don't run them down. It doesn't matter who they are, what race they are, or where they come from, or what their social status is. We are kind to that person, and we, we love God, and we love people. So to love God and each other is to follow the principles that are given by Moses and the prophets and the Savior and the apostles. Point two, we come to the scope of biblical morality and we are introduced to the epistle of Colossae in chapter one. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. Back to the title of today's lesson, The Bible Provides Moral Guidance. Let's talk a little bit about Colossae. This is a city in what is, which is now known as Turkey. And it's up the coast, the Mediterranean coast from the land of Israel. It juts out to border on the Aegean Sea which if you cross, you get into the, uh, the country of, of Greece. So Colossae is about 100 miles east of Ephesus. In, the, in Ephesus, Paul, Paul built a church there with some help. He stayed there two years and taught that church what God had instructed him and filled his mind and heart with the new covenant, not the old, but the brand new. Nobody in that time had a New Testament. Everything was brand new. And God would reveal to these men, like the Apostle Paul, his will and how it, it uh, brought about and came to pass that was recorded in the old law. But we didn't have the New Testament for quite a while after the Holy Spirit fell in Jerusalem. In fact, in the church at Colossae, Paul did not start that church, but he did minister in Ephesus. So there were there were men in Ephesus. Uh, one was called Epaphras and the other one Archippus. And they went up. These two brothers had been saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit in that great church at Ephesus. And they took a little journey a hundred miles to the east, started the church at Colossae. And Paul heard about the faith and the love of these people that had just come to know him as their personal savior and had been baptized in water and had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. He did not uh, make a trip there at this time, but he did send a letter, an epistle. And what we have today is the fourth chapter of the letter that he sent to this church. He, uh, he is very proud of the testimonies that come from the converts at this church. The, the uh, leaders will send word back to Paul that they are full of faith 
and they love the Lord with all of their heart. They have given up so much of the world, and idol worship that was prevalent around them. They were on fire for the Lord, and Paul was exceedingly glad that this had happened in this town. So in chapter 1 of Colossae, verse 1, he is talking to them about their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the love that they have for all of the saints. When he sent this, this, this epistle, he probably also sent the letter that he sent to Philemon. Philemon is one of my very favorite books, and it's a very short little letter. But Philemon and Onesimus, some of the other brothers of whom we read about, lived in Colossae. It seems that Philemon was a more than average person as far as the world's goods are concerned and had a slave named Onesimus. Philemon was a good Christian, but Onesimus was laboring under that title of slave, hated it with all of his heart. I remember a sermon that I heard when I was about 16. We were in camp meeting in Lubbock, Texas. The campgrounds in that location was just a tabernacle. That means that the sides were open air, had a nice roof over it, cement floor, and uh, uh, crude pews, but, but serviceable. And on the sides of the tabernacle was, were both hills that sloped down to the level of the ground. And during camp meeting, they were always covered with grass that had been recently mowed. It was a great time. I loved to go to camp meeting under that old tabernacle. This was way back, like in 1956. And Paul Lewinberg from Kansas was the speaker for that particular occasion. And he preached on the book of Philemon. He talked about Onesimus and the urging that he had to be free, how he just was grinding his teeth under the affliction of being somebody's slave. I don't know where he came from or where Philemon might have found him, but one day he got up the courage and he left that home in that country. I don't know if he stole something to have money to get to his trip, he must have, because when Paul writes to Philemon, he says, whatever was taken from you, I will repay it. He traveled by night. He was constantly on the alert for anyone who might be out hunting runaway slaves. And he got to the city of Rome where Paul was in prison. When he got there, he found the apostle Paul and Paul led Onesimus to the Lord. It's one of the most beautiful stories in the whole New Testament, and every time I read it, I just can't help but think of what the blood of Jesus Christ has done for multitudes upon multitudes of people that have found freedom from sin and have found the freedom that comes with a life that is born again. Paul sat down and wrote a letter to Philemon, and he asked him if he would not forgive this man, and if he had done him wrong or taken anything that didn't belong to him. He said, I, Paul, will repay this with my own hand. Those two lived in the city of Colossae. That must have been one more church full of the Holy Ghost full of people that had given up the life of sin to be born again and live for Christ Jesus. Paul established the ministry at 
the city of Ephesus, as I mentioned before, which is about 100 miles west of Colossae, and he preached there for uh, about two years. And <clears throat> probably it was there that Epaphras carried the gospel to Colossae, and he started that church there. Then Paul wrote the epistle to that church when he was in prison in Rome. That is my introduction to the epistle of Colossae. We come to point A of our second, the scope of biblical morality, uh, verse 1 of chapter 3. If then you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. I have the phrase seated at the right hand of God underlined in the notes. I did that for a, pur a special purpose. Um, back to Manners and Customs of the Bible by James Freeman, he says that the right hand is considered the post of the highest honor. So our Lord Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father, which is the highest post of honor. We serve him today. We serve him and he made possible that we too can one day enjoy fellowship around the throne of God. Paul urges in his letter, he urges the people of Colossae to maintain a good spiritual life. He said that the work on the cross was a finished work. You don't need anything else. The work on the cross purchased your salvation if you ask and you confess your sins and become born again, that's the sum total of that experience. You do not have to go to horoscopes or fortune telling or dabbling in good witchcraft or anything like that. All of those things can lead to deception. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life and he is the mediator we have no other go between between god and man but the man jesus christ so if we're living for the lord and there's some things that we don't know exactly if we should participate or not a good question to ask is what would jesus do remember a few years ago that was a very popular question what would Jesus do? There were books written about it. There were messages preached. But it is a very wise and practical question for anybody. We need to remember that Jesus Christ is our substitute. And we died to sin through him. One day he will come back and receive us. He will come back and give every saint a glorified body. We watched astronauts on their way to the space station just a few days ago. They were dressed in special garments. They rode in special equipment. They had a host of people on the ground that were maneuvering that spacecraft to the place where it should be. And they gave details of every little thing that was going on. But one day, when the trumpet sounds, the Bible tells us that the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds of heaven. Our bodies will not have to have a spacesuit for they are going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. 
We don't know what we shall be, but we know that we'll be like him in reading what Jesus was like after his crucifixion. He said, touch me, and he had flesh, and he had bones. There was no blood, but he had the ability to soar through the skies without any kind of implementation that was created by men. We are awaiting that special time. What a glorious day that will be. One day, everybody will recognize that his way was the way of salvation. For those who are left behind will go through some of the most awful, awful tribulation as described in the scriptures that the world has ever seen. Now then, this particular lesson that deals with how the Bible gives us a moral compass, tells us to abandon the old life in verses 5 through 9 of chapter 3. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Okay, in the notes I underlined the phrase, children of disobedience. And back to the Manners and Customs book of James Freeman, he explained that when the phrase <coughs> has to do with child or children, that uh, that's a form of speech that is designed to so show some relation between the person to whom it's applied and the qualities existing in that person or certain circumstances connected with him. So when any passion or influence, good or bad, gets control of men, they are said to be the children of that passion or that influence. So when Paul talks about uh, children of disobedience, that just means they are human beings that have that vent in them to give way to disobedience. Disobedience to what? To the morality that's in this book right here. Impurity, greed, malice, falsehood, these are native to humans. I'm going to do that again. Impurity, greed, malice, falsehood. We were, we were bored with those things. They are native to humans. But Christ will not dwell in the soul while sin controls the body. Okay, these are the list of examples of conduct that have no place in the life of the believer. Leda, would you like to read those off of the board, please? Bodily self-respect must be practiced. Sexual impurity the most conspicuous sin in the Gentile world. This is an insult to the Holy Spirit who has marked the human body for his temple. When Christian faith grows weak and dies down, sexual perversion follows and grows. Covetousness, idolatry. The man or woman seeks to gain power over others by the worship of shams and shows. Malice, delighting in injury to others. A malicious person is a peril to everyone. It involves rage, jealousy, and murderous passions sleeping in the blood. Cain and Abel. 
lying. If impurity dishonors the body, lying dishonors the mind. Lying makes us like the devil, the father of lies. Many would not tell a lie with words, but will act it. The Christian must quit sin. Watch out telling untruths. If you're telling the untruth, and everybody knows it's an untruth, they won't believe anything else that you ever say. It's very bad. And besides, the Bible says all liars shall have their place in the lake of fire. <laughs> I, I, I remembered a lie that I told once that I never told anybody. <laughs> that makes another one. <laughs> Let's go to point C. <laughs> Believers are one in Christ, and we will go to verses 10 and 11 of chapter 3. And hath put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, thank you, Scythian, slave or freeman, but Christ is all and in all. Having been born again, we are new creatures in Christ. We are brand new in Christ when we have become born again. We have a new heart. We think new thoughts. We're living a new life. And every day we should be growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to manners and customs, it was customary to have registers of citizenship in which were entered the names of citizens, both natural and adopted in that particular country. So heaven is represented as a city and its inhabitants are registered. Our names are written in the book of life. Some who have not yet reached that heavenly city are regarded as citizens on their way home. Their names are registered with the ones who have gone before us who are already there. If we could only know what awaits us after this life and the kind of body that we're going to have after this life, Death would not be so fearsome to us. And we would be in a place with literally hundreds and thousands of people who have gone on before us and have found their place in that heavenly city. And Paul says, when we're born again, we become citizens of heaven regardless of what race we are and were on the earth. He reminds us that there's no distinction in the born-again life between the Greek and, and the Jew, the circumcised, the uncircumcised, the barbarian, the Scythian, the slave, the free men. The born-again child of God takes on the characteristics of Jesus Christ. Now, there's something to think about. I know we have... Um, a group of brothers and sisters in the church world who, who think once you become born again, you're that way for life. But, but something to think about is when one was deprived of citizenship, his name was erased from the role of citizens. And you can find references to this in Exodus 32, Psalm 69 who says, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Revelation 3 and 5, he who overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So 
if you don't believe you can backslide, uh, maybe you better wait until life is over and see for sure <laughs> if there really is a chance that you might not make it. Just live right. Live according to the principles of God's Word. We come to point three today, the goal of biblical morality, and we're in ch chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, and verse 24. And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, Bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Amen. We're talking about the morality that we find in this, in this book. God's holy word. And when we become born again, we call it becoming Christian, but actually it is the act of being born again. These are the new Christian virtues. We have gentleness, forgiveness, and love. And he in whose heart dwells the love of Christ cannot shut up his compassion. He in whose heart dwells the love of Christ cannot be rude, hard, unforgiving. He whose heart, in whose heart dwells the love of Christ can't demand his own way, be clamorous and overbearing. And he whose heart, in whose heart dwells the love of Christ cannot be resentful, irritable, fault-finding, hard-headed, prejudiced, and intolerant of opposition. The love of Christ makes us sweet, gracious, unselfish, and loving. And there is a story of a stubborn old farmer who was plowing his field. He used a mule and a homemade plow. A neighbor who was watching as he tried to guide the mule finally said, I don't want to butt in, but you can save yourself a lot of work by saying G and haw instead of jerking on the reins. And the old timer mopped his brow and he replied, Yep, I know, but this here mule kicked me six years ago and I ain't spoke to him since. <laughs> now you tell me, what does that have to do with today's lesson? <laughs> You have to be a pastor to really understand that little story. Sometimes, sometimes it's difficult to get people back together again in a loving relationship after there's been a split in the church. And point B, our third point is serve the Lord, verse 16, 17, and 24. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Preaching and teaching the word along with singing is the theme of these verses. And we get down to something that's very, very precious to me. And that's the music of the church. And Paul tells us that both the word spoken and the word that is sung is very important where there are gatherings in the name of Jesus Christ. For songs to take on a teaching role, they have to be sound doctrinally and measure up to the Word of God. Whatever we do, whether it's music or the spoken word, it all must be done 
in the authority and for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Words set to music based on the word of the Lord have oftentimes brought peace to a troubled soul that's really struggling through the valley of the shadow of death. In congregations, when people assemble and you have uh, people that are sitting next to you, maybe the one that you are seated beside is going through something really difficult that you know nothing about. Maybe a dear friend or even a relative, but you don't know the struggle that's inside that heart. And while they're sitting there, it could have been a spoken word or it could have been a word that is sung. Tears begin to pour down their cheeks and they begin to worship the Lord, which lets us to know that the word is powerful, very powerful. There was something that was said that spoke to the heart of that troubled person and caused him to know that through the Holy Spirit, that it was going to be okay. The Holy Spirit knows exactly what a child of God needs, and he knows when the help will be most beneficial. My first experience of singing in church was in a little country church shaped like a cracker box with a hip roof. Had one aisle down the middle. Our first song book was just like this. It was an R.E. Winson book. This one was published in the 30s. Our book was like this, only it didn't have purple color. It had gray color. And in this song was all time songs. In the city where the Lamb is the light, will you meet me over yonder? Oh, I want to see him. I'll be listening, the lily of the valley, leaning on the everlasting arms, life's setting sun, where we'll never grow old. R.E. Winson published this book, and that was the first one that I remember. This came from um, Dr. Owen's library. He was the uh, archaeology writer of the Thompson Chain Bible. And he saved this, and it's in good condition, and I was really glad. <laughs> he departed in 1990. The next one that I remember, this one came from the, uh, <clears throat> it was Shape Notes, and the Stamps Music Company put these out. So we've got favorite songs in and hymns, This World Is Not My Home, when they ring the golden bells. Um, uh, there's here, bore it all, old time power. Hallelujah, we shall rise when the roll is called up yonder. All those songs that we grew up with. And then we got classy and we went to round notes. This was the first one that I remember. Actually, these are shaped too. Hymns of glorious praise. Some of the old songs were put in here, make me a blessing, never alone have thy own way, Lord, since Jesus came into my heart. And we sung at the top of our, our voice, and we worshiped and praised. And sometimes people would get happy right where they were standing, they'd shout and dance and praise the Lord. I, I remember one lady that stomped, and she stomped in the same place for so many years that finally the floor gave way. It was kind of interesting. The next one that I, that I have in my library is the latest one that we got from Springfield, Sing His Praise. And there are some of the old songs in here and some of the new. How can I help but love him? I believe the true report. People need the Lord. Send the fire, fresh anointing, and so on. But music that is doctrinally sound and the word spoken will bring comfort in heart to those who are sitting in our congregation. 
I leave you with this paragraph. To have his or her congregation leave as servants having been uplifted by the spoken word or the word set to music is the goal of every true minister of the gospel. Our pastors are under heavy responsibility in their calling to feed the flock. They have children, youth, middle-aged, and older. If you preach to the children, then the uh, older people will feel like um, they need a little bit more strength in the sermon. If you preach to the youth, um, then the children feel like they're being left out. And if you preach to the middle-aged and the older people, then you've got the young people kind of sitting back in the pew. The responsibility of the pastor is to feed the flock. And I can tell you, it is not an easy job. Our responsibility is to consistently pray for God's strength in and through the pastor of the local church as he fulfills his calling. And we remember our pastors are human too. Let's go back to our golden text as we wind up today's lesson. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. This is the book that will take you to heaven. Read it and study it and apply it to your life. God bless you. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have given us the word. I thank you for men and women who have pioneered over the years of the earth's existence in these New Testament times to give us the gospel. May this word be blessed and may it strengthen those who hear in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.